Every group of friends has that one person who knows everything about music. But it's really no exaggeration when I say that Jorge Gonzalez is a bona fide expert on Afro-Latin music. Its roots, its history, its context. I dig. I collect music. That's definitely something that I've been doing for many, many years. And he credits his insatiable curiosity to growing up in our border region. You hear just so many genres of music, even in Tijuana. The diversity of immigrants that live in that city alone exposes you to a lot of styles. I think it's my background, my identity of always trying to figure out my place in time, my own identity, that made me look into music in that same lens. You might recognize Jorge's voice from our earlier episode on the birth of the Black Lives Matter movement at the border. He wrote his master's thesis on Afro-Mexican history and is now the director of the Afro-Mexican department at the World Beat Center in San Diego. Music contains a lot of important historical documentation through the lyrics, through the sounds, vinyl, and the sleeve notes and everything that comes with it contains a lot of information. Jorge's love for Latin music and history has led him on a lifelong quest to understand how these Latin genres came to be. Naturally, that quest led him back to Africa, and the long journey these sounds took to become Latin. From KPBS and PRX, this is Port of Entry. I'm Alan Liliental. On this podcast, we tell cross-border stories that connect us. And maybe nothing connects us or shows the connections between us more than music. Every once in a while in this program, we do a music episode where we ask border people to take us on a musical journey. Today, we're going to take a mini trip through the evolution of Latin music, unpacking layers of its foundation rooted in West Africa. I, for one, had no idea just how African Latin music really is. Black people have been in the Americas for centuries, and that has been integral to the development of Latin music. There's no way we can cover it all in one episode, so this is just Jorge's little taster, like a playlist with a side of history lesson. Stay with me. We start our journey in West Africa, way back in the 16th century. What's now known as Senegal and Mali was part of the homeland of the Mande and Bantu people who were among the first to be enslaved and taken to Latin America. And Jorge says the narrative that these enslaved Africans were uneducated is just wrong. Imagine the first slave ships would arrive to Veracruz instead of thinking just a thousand slaves that didn't know how to read or write these were maybe a thousand slaves that had the consciousness of Malcolm X. They knew history. They were very conscious. They just happened to be, you know, stolen and taken. The Mande and Bantu were also Muslim. And if you know Muslim culture, Islam, they know how to read and oral tradition is a big deal. And music is a big deal. And then spiritual music. There's no question whether music is, is part of their daily lives. Basically, the West African ties to Latin American music run deep. Culturally, there was a lot of music that came from Africa straight into the Port of Veracruz, to Peru, to Brazil. These were the same people getting off and for the first time, you know, building relationships with the indigenous communities. Jorge says this is how a West African instrument called the Cora became integral to the development of Latin American music. It is a gourd with a bow, and you have chords that connect it to the drum. If you hear the sound, it's just very spiritual. It almost sounds like a voice, right, singing, because it just has so many chords. This song is called Dudu, a collaboration by Malian artists Ali Farcature and Tumani Diviate. When I heard it, I was like, this is it. This is the track that is, is a testament, right, of how their sound that they were creating was replicated and cross-pollinated to the Americas. This is the instrument, some would argue, that the harp comes from. And also, this is an instrument that influenced a lot of the Spanish guitars, you know, like flamenco. 
the way it's played. And this was the same instrument that would inspire the requintos in, in Latin America, uh, in boleros, you hear it. From Mali, we're headed to Peru. This is Son de los Diablos by a group called Peru Negro. They come from a town called Chincha. Chincha is a black community in Peru. That whole area of Chincha is very rooted in the style of music. I think one of the most unique characteristics of the sound is the call and response. You could hear it through the instrumentation alone. There's a call and response in the instrumentation, but also when they sing. I had this moment, right, of like, wow, this sounds so similar to something, I can't figure it out. It hits me when I hear this track, Dudu. And if you hear Dudu and you hear Son de los Diablos, it's the same track and just in a different version, right? It's, it's the same rhythm, it's the same harmony you hear behind it. Next up on our trip, Veracruz, Mexico. Veracruz is Mexico's most important port and is actually where the Spanish conquest of Mexico began. When the Spanish arrived, they brought a lot of African slaves from Cuba who over time started mixing with the European and indigenous people. This community eventually became known as Jarochos. This is Son del Mar by a group called Los Cojolites. In Veracruz, where Los Cojolites is from, there's all these African named communities that are very much aware and are Afro-descendants of this legacy. During the early uprisings in Mexico and Latin America, there was a law that passed that banned Africans from being in groups bigger than six. Also, their drums were taken away. So stomping and rhythm composition began to really be reflected in the instrumentation of strumming guitars, or known as jaranas, which are very rhythmic and very drum-like. Jorge says this percussive style of playing the jaranas is how these maroon and Afro-indigenous communities in Veracruz birthed the musical style Son Jarocho. They adopted this style that was at one point very Spanish-based, and they redid it in their, in their own way. Next on our tour, the epicenter of the cross-pollination of African and Latin culture, Cuba. Cuba and Puerto Rico would become like the layover before African slaves would make it, either get sold there or get sold elsewhere. The boats that would eventually go to Venezuela, Colombia, Brazil, New Orleans would make a stop in Cuba. This is El Carretero by Buena Vista Social Club. The African presence in Cuba is huge. It was Spain's occupation that completely destroyed Cuba's indigenous population in the 1500s. And over the next few centuries, Africans were enslaved and taken to Cuba by both the Spanish and the British to expand production of sugarcane. Africans eventually outnumbered Europeans on the island. This is a country life that a lot of Africans experience, so it just makes sense that a lot of the folk soul music would sound the way it does, very melancholic. And you hear the, the, the mimicking of the cora. Buena Vista Social Club was a 1996 reunion of some of Havana's best Afro-Cuban musicians. It was also a real venue where some of these musicians would jam together in the 1940s and 50s, a time when the Afro-Cuban music scene thrived. Every artist and musician that participated in this album 
They were around, you know, at the peak of the golden era of the music Cuban scene in the 1950s, who had gotten forgotten, you know, after the Cuban Revolution. Before the revolution ended in 1959, Havana felt more like Vegas. The government in place let the American mob put up countless casinos and nightclubs. But post-revolution, Cuba's new government shut many venues down in an effort to clean up what it saw as a hedonistic lifestyle. Many of these musicians lost their livelihood almost immediately. The 1996 Buena Vista Social Club project saw an enormous amount of worldwide success, but it was actually supposed to be a larger collaboration between Afro-Cuban musicians and musicians from Senegal and Mali. That fell apart because the African musicians couldn't get their visas on time, though they were eventually able to get together. They called themselves Afro-Cubism. This song is called Mali Cuba. To Jorge, this track by Afrocubism perfectly encapsulates the ongoing and evolving conversation between Latin and African music. You hear the coda, you hear the the polyrhythm, the conversation, call and response behind the percussion. Polyrhythms are super common in Latin and African music. It's when there are two or more rhythmic patterns played by different instruments at the same time. conversation that they're having you know we often think about jazz having the same kind of structure there's no voice in this this track in particular but for me it's the conversation that these instruments are having that becomes the voice the music We've talked a lot about this East to West crossover, but Latin styles of music have also made their way back to West Africa. It wasn't always a one-way conversation. It's been always both ways. Just the way they were getting sounds from Africa, they were sending music back, early forms of vinyls. They were reaching, you know, Senegal, and they would be fascinated. This is El Son Te Llama by Orquestra Baobab, a band from Senegal who became popular in the 1970s for combining Afro-Cuban music with more traditional Senegalese sounds. Orchestra Baobab have a long history of becoming one of the pioneers of this Afro-Cuban African sound in Senegal that became a, there, there was a big scene. There were people craved this Afro-Cuban sound. They sing it in Spanish with an accent. You, you hear it in, in, their, you know, in the way they, their style of singing. There's some other tracks of theirs where they sing in Senegalese, uh, but the style is Afro-Cuban. <laughs> So a lot of this continued zigzag of African and Latin music. Jorge again credits Cuba because of its radio transmitters, especially before its government assumed control of broadcast media in the 1960s. The radio airways would reach anywhere in the Gulf of Mexico or anywhere in in Colombia or Venezuela. So some, some of these little rural community towns would turn on the FM station and they would listen to a radio station from Cuba that would be playing music from Africa. In the 60s and 70s, along with radio, there was also a unique underground scene of record collectors in Colombia, where we're headed to next. These DJs were called Picos. Picos, Picos, right? P-I-C-O. And it has to do with pickups, because they would put the sound systems on top of pickup trucks, and they would go around towns bringing that one vinyl that one DJ had that was from Africa and, and everybody wanted. (laughs) 
Jorge says tracks like this one were for sure blasted out of those picos in Colombia back in the day. This is Nga Nga by Ghanaian musician Ebo Taylor, a pioneer of highlife music and Afrobeat. Highlife is like everyday music in, in Ghana. You hear it everywhere, you know? It's like reggae in Jamaica. The Ghanaian people were bringing a lot of that jazz that was coming from, you know, the London scene and their, their access to it through the British connection. The economy was thriving. Uh, the music scene was at a boom. You know, James Brown was coming to town and performing. And these artists of, uh, who were playing high life, a lot of them would gravitate towards that funk sound that, that James Brown would, would bring, right? We hear some synthesizers, we hear some effects. The beauty of it is it's, just, it's the connection of how these African sounds was reaching the coast of Colombia, and it all happened with the DJ scene. But then, you know, they wouldn't wait till the next time the Pico or the DJ sound system would arrive to their communities to hear it, but they would start mimicking the sounds. Jorge says one of the Colombian musicians to pick up on Afrobeat legends like Ebo Taylor was Michi Sarmiento, who grew up in an Afro-Indigenous community. This song is called El Arroyo de Macuya. This is very much Evil Taylor's track, in Nga that we were listening to earlier. You hear the call and response. Uh, writing in Afrobeat, West African polyrhythms, rhythm section. Michi Sarmiento is one of those musicians that uh, began to replicate those sounds because people wanted to hear more of those type of sounds. It's very evident, you know, his influence of Afrobeat and, and from musicians like Abel Taylor. Next, we're going to pop over to the Dominican Republic with a track that fuses reggae, a genre deeply tied to celebrating and connecting to African roots, with a more Dominican flavor, bachata. Bachata is the most celebrated genre in the Dominican Republic. The songs are usually kind of ballad but always with a lively percussion driving the energy forward and giving it that classic Latin touch. This is Vicente Garcia. The track is Bachata in Kingston. Siembro, tiro la semilla y disfruto el fruto Rompo la cadena, siembro pa' que vuelva Y que me resuelva Bachata in Kingston speaks to itself. This is a bachata reggae track. What you're hearing there is bachata is that guitar playing in the back, is the bongos that are very notorious, I think, in bachata, the style of playing, very fast polyrhythms being played, the skanking guitar that I think that defines the, the reggae sound in the back, and, and then the dubbing. Uh, when you dub music, when you delay music, that originates from Jamaica. I just love this track by Chat in Kingston because it really, again, speaks to this, this relationship with the Caribbean, right? That there's always been an influence of the Caribbean to countries like Colombia, and in this case, Dominica Republica. There's cross-pollination happening all over. The rest of our tour is going to be focused on the northern side of our border region, from San Diego to Northern California. As you've heard by now, African music has touched many corners of Latin American music. Here in California, the gateway to Latin America, the influence has taken on a life of its own. Next up is the LA band Quitapenas. 
This is La Educación. As soon as the track hits, it, you know, you're hearing West African again. The guitar gives it away. It's, it, if you hear West African music, you know, it's a key sound in, in high life music, you know, the guitar. I think Ita Pena is one of those those bands that really are paying homage to those sounds of that come from Colombia and diversify the sound of what we know as cumbia. Cumbia is a style of music that has been adopted all over Latin America. The word cumbia is thought to come from the African word cumbe, meaning dance. The genre originates in Colombia, where African slaves started interacting with the indigenous populations. For me, as soon as I hear that Guido doing the or really any instrument doing that rhythm, I know I'm in for some tasty cumbia. Next up, a band that's been in San Diego for decades, B-Side Players. This track is called Calavera Negra. This is definitely, you know, a band that really reflect the border sound that fuses reggae, cumbia, funk, Latin jazz. And this track, Calavera Negra, you know, pays homage to the African root in, in, in Latin music. The whole track is built around the phrase, En Africa nació el tambor, meaning the drum was born in Africa. This sound, I think for me, it's more of a, a border hybrid cumbia sound. Uh, you know, I would say it's a very Tejano style of, of cumbia, which is sometimes has the accordion, but sometimes it's, it's just that rhythmic section in the guitar that really stands out a lot. And then just the cowbell that's very consistent throughout the whole song. It's very unique, I think, to, to the border. All right, we're going to wrap things up with a truly eclectic track by a group based out of the Bay Area. This is Capitan by Sistema Bomb, featuring Asdru Sierra of Ozomatli. Aside from the more modern cumbia beat we're hearing in the percussion, Jorge says there's a lot more going on here. First of all, it's electro son jarocho, like I, I had never heard anything like it. So we've got a cumbia beat, the jaranas of son jarocho, even that reggae influence skanking guitar. What brings it home, though, is a nod to the Norteño music that we hear all over the San Diego, Tijuana region. For me, when I hear that accordion style of playing, I, I think of like the bandas in Tijuana. If you're like in, in La Revolución or in downtown Tijuana, all those bandas that, you know, you, you could just pay and people, you know, the bands would play you any song you want. This project for me, it's, it's one of those sounds that I think really remind me of the border, right? And that style of Norteña music, right? And then cross-pollinating sounds, son jarocho, but really rooted in that cumbia and paying homage to that African sound. <laughs> That's it for our mini tour today. We really hope you enjoyed it as much as we did and that it widened your appreciation for the richness of Latin music. We covered a whole lot, but it barely scratches the surface of Latin music's diverse history. If you want to dive deeper into the African roots of Latin music, check out our show notes. 
Jorge put together a list of books and other resources. You can also find all the music you just heard and more on our Port of Entry playlist on Spotify. Just search Port of Entry playlist in Spotify and it'll pop up. This episode was written and produced by Emily Jankowski. Emily is also our director of sound design. Curtis Fox edited the show. Lisa Morissette is operations manager and John Decker is director of programming. Port of Entry is made possible in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people. I'm Alan Liriental. Thank you so much for listening.